Right, welcome to our final and some say our most popular, no pressure, panel of the Global Borrowers and Bond Investors Forum, The Economist's Perspective. Um, this year, the overarching question we'll be trying to answer is, will political tensions derail a rosy economy? And that comes off our opening panel, which was entitled The End of the World, and the Black Sons panel we've just had today. So, it, so we're, we're, we're optimists at Euromoney. So where do we start in terms of political tensions? Well, we've got Trump, trade wars, Europe, Quitterly, Brexit, Russia, Middle East, Syria, China, North Korea, there are any number of potential geopolitical stumbling blocks that could easily derail a rosy economy. And yet, so far, nothing that happens on the world stage, no geopolitical crisis from populism to the threat of nuclear war, seems to make the slightest dent in the confidence of financial markets. They just shrug it off. In fact, market shrug off, dot, 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 insert geopolitical crisis here, must be one of the most frequent FT or Wall Street Journal um, headlines of the last couple of years. So what is powering this onward and upward surge in markets? Irrational exuberance or the market equivalent to a Kim Jong-un rally where <coughs> nobody wants to be seen as the first one to stop clapping? Uh, and what exactly could possibly throw us off course? We're going to find out today. For me, markets are like the bumblebee. Aerodynamically speaking, there is no way that the bumblebee should be able to fly. It defies the laws of physics. And yet the bumblebee doesn't know this, so the bumblebee keeps flying anyway. So before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to put up our opening poll, which we, you can all get busy um, polling on, if we could get that up there. And also, please submit questions to the app if you have a question, or just stick your hand in the air at any point. Um, so. I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists. First of all, we have Eric Bergloff. Um, Eric is director of the Institute of Global Affairs at the London School of Economics and formerly chief economist and special advisor to the president of the EBRD. Now, I'm going to each, each uh, panelist, I'm going to give one of their quotes to give us some colour. So speaking to a Business Insider magazine last year, Eric warned that Brexit could hurt, among other UK sectors, the financial sector. Quite a lot of it comes down to passporting, said Eric. And it's extremely important to London firms that there is an equivalence of what Britain has now post-Brexit. But I'm not sure this is enough for the financial sector. We'll find out more, view more views later on that. Uh, next, we have Sarah Hewin. Sarah is Chief Economist for Europe at Standard Chartered Bank. Um, Sarah leads the bank's research on European economies, including Western and emerging Europe, and is a frequent commentator for the BBC, Sky, CNBC, and Bloomberg. Um, Sarah, in the past, you've been a big advocate for EU reform <coughs> and wrote uh, in, 2050, in a 2015 paper, let's see if your views have changed, policymakers in the EU urgently need to take action on the next stage of integration, accelerating risk-sharing measures while raising the region's productivity. Um, next, we have, um, uh, not in the order on my page, uh, Darvel Joshi. Welcome, Darvel. Um, he, uh, uh, Darvel is Senior Vice President for European Investment Strategy at BCA Research. Um, he is an award-winning analyst with a background in both research and investment management. Um, he was recently quoted in The Guardian warning on Italy's zombie banks and the very real danger of insolvency. Um, next, we have Klaus uh, Visterson. Uh, he is Chief Eurozone Economist at US-based Pantheon Macroeconomics. Klaus focuses on the Eurozone with particular emphasis on Germany and France and on ECB policy. On tapering, ECB tapering, Klaus told Market Watch last year, Mr. Draghi is putting markets on notice. Don't go overboard and start pricing in rate hikes immediately after QE ends. Last, not least, Peter Westaway, Chief Economist and Head of Investment Strategy at Vanguard Europe, in a recent blog, Peter said the notion of a trade war prompting investors to move to US stocks was a bit of a fallacy. The impact of less trade, more protectionism, is, in the end, likely to not only harm the countries overseas where trade is being diverted away from, but it can also harm US equities as well. And that is our panel. Welcome to you all. Um, now, I'd like, to, I'd like us to start, maybe, maybe let's, let's start on the results of our, I haven't looked yet at the results of our poll. So, State of the World, pick the song that most sums up your mood about global markets. Well, here comes the rain again. <laughs> the moment is the big winner. Well, we, we, we'll come back to that, because what I want you first to do, starting with Peter, is to, on a scale of 1 to 10, 
how optimistic are you for the future of the global economy? And I, I, I want to separate the bulls from the bears, the doves from the hawks. So one to three, we're going to hell in a handcart. Three to seven, cautiously optimistic. Seven to eight, all systems go for sustainable growth. Ten, open the champagne and put down the deposit for the Maserati. Where do you stand, Peter, in that scale? It's such a complicated question, and a <laughs> multi-dimensional answer is all that anyone could ever give. But if you're going to force me, I'm going to say six, cautiously optimistic, in the sense that, for now, I see the economy continuing to recover, not least because the largest economy in the world has got its foot flat down on the accelerator with the fiscal policy expansion. Further out, I think there are risks that could, could derail it. But for now, I'm in the moderately optimistic camp. Moderately optimistic, Klaus. Um, I'm... I would, on that scale, <clears throat> I would probably go for five. I think that, um, and the vector is down, um, and that's because we've come probably from a seven and eight last year. I think there's a lot of optimism. We have the synchronized global recovery. I think that's over now, uh, which is probably also what we're going to uh, see once that poll gets done. So that's, you know, I'm, uh, I, had you asked me six months ago, I would have said seven, but now I'm on five. You're a fiver, we're ca another cautious one, mm -hmm. Darvel. So on that, on that specific question, I'm an eight. Ooh, so I actually excellent. think that um, there's a lot of good stuff going on, but no one really wants to talk about it because it doesn't make, you know, it's not sensationalist enough to talk mm. about sort of moderately good things that are going on. However, what I would say is for the financial market, I would actually go to three or four. In other words, a good economy, an eight, doesn't necessarily translate into money-making opportunities mm. in the financial market. So if I was answering the, that question, the song question. Oh yes, what's your song? Um, I don't know, but it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be Here Comes the Sun. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, you're in good company there. But I'm um, just saying that there's a difference between the outlook for the economy and the outlook for the markets. You know, you can, you can have a very different view on the two. Heaven knows I'm miserable now. Heaven knows. <laughs> yes, you, you feel free to think of another song. Um, Sarah, I'll, I'll move to you on, your, on, on this scale of one to ten and, and your song. Um, on the scale of one to ten, I'd say seven, but I think within that, you've probably got an eight and a half for the U.S. and probably a six and a half for the, uh, uh, or f uh, five and a half for, for Europe. Um, I mean, there are clearly good. There's a lot of good news around, but uh, at the moment, we're focusing very much on what the headwinds are to growth. Um, but I think overall, reasonably optimistic. So seven. A seven, cautiously optimistic. Um, uh, wh where do you stand? these issues? Well, so I think a little bit, as, as, as you were saying, it depends on where you are yes. so, and, and who you are. So I think on, on the whole, uh, I, I'm probably six, uh, but if I were in an emerging economy now, I would be much less optimistic. And if I'm thinking about our children, I would be even less uh, optimistic. OK. Oh, definitely the end of the world camp. Um, so, uh, if, if, you, if I had to force you to give me a number... I, I gave you a six. Oh, did you? Give me a six. Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, I was no, I'm taking not in the end of the world. Uh, number six. So, you're not in the world. You're, you're, you're cautiously optimistic. We're all cautiously optimistic, except for Darrell, who's, who's, who's pretty cheerful. Um, so, let's, let's move on to, to, to the first geopolitical um, uh, factor, which we've labelled top Trump, impact of monetary, fiscal, foreign and domestic policy. Where do we start with Trump? What are the chances, Peter, we'll just start at the end and go through, of, of uh, the US stroke a Trump presidency derailing this, this rosy, well, partly rosy, economic, cautiously optimistic scenario? Well, I think in terms of straight macro policies, what Trump is doing for the global economy is, is quite positive in, in the short run. It's, it still has, not that, not that Trump's doing this, but the Fed is still relatively accommodative. Fiscal policy is extremely accommodative and stimulatory, albeit at precisely the wrong time. The last time you want to have a large fiscal expansion is just as the economy is reaching full capacity. So, so on the kind of conventional measures, um, the US is definitely contributing and, and helping the, the world economy to grow. But I think when one looks at some of the risks that are out there, whether one's talking about the possibility of an escalating trade war, which even as the weeks go by, has, has moved from being just about a China-US bilateral trade dispute into one that's potentially even global. So I think that's definitely a downside risk. 
Um, I think what's happening on the political side has had knock-on effects for oil prices, so that's having negative effects for, for emerging markets as well. Um, and then in the end, I think all of that, uh, certainly the, the expansionary fiscal policy, does lay open the possibility that the Fed at some point may end up having to put rates up more quickly than is currently priced in if, if inflation does get out of the bag. So, so I think all of those things down the line are quite risky for the, for the global economy. So there's a, there's a lot of risk. Do so you agree that there's a lot of risk there? Uh, yeah, I mean, from the I, I, yes, I agree. I, I agree with that analysis. I mean, the thing about Trump's policies is that on, on, on the surface, they are designed to, I mean, he wants to reduce the trade deficit with his main trading partners and, and America first. But, I mean, in the short run, I mean, he's going to achieve the exact opposite. Uh, you have a, a late cycle economy with a record low domestic savings rate, and you have a widening twin deficit. They're going to suck in imports from the rest of the world, and the rest of the world is just sitting there. They are willing to finance it. So we are looking now, I think, potentially at, 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 a, at a Trump economy which is going to run really, really hot for, for a short while. But the thing is, the Fed is on the case, right? And that's... That's where, um, that's where things get, get interesting um, from the point of view of for investors in terms of how to space this because um, we know what happens. The Fed will keep going until something breaks. That's just what the Fed does and, and hmm. then we can discuss when that is and, and, and everybody is, is looking at the yield curve. When does that invert? When does that? But that doesn't have to be the key uh, aspect. But right now, I think we, we have the contours of a U, U, U.S. economy, which is doing very well in the very short run, but the Fed is catching up. And I think that's how to juxtapose those two forces are, are really what's important. Okay. Oh, uh, U.S. overheating economy, inverted um, yield curves. Flat yield curves now. What, what, is this? what are we being told by this? What's happening? Um, I'm a sort of li bit, bit of a contrarian thinker. I think a lot of um, the, 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 you know, the things that people said are, that are good from, from sort of Trumponomics are actually not that good. Um, and some of the things which are, which are bad probably have a sort of silver lining to them. So, for example, the, the, the fiscal stimulus, everyone says this is great because it's going to you know, make the economy run hot or whatever. But the point is fiscal stimulus never works um, when the private sector is, is already functioning well. So what, you know, what the so-called technical term fiscal multiplier is actually very low when you know, the banking system is working well, the private sector you know, has got uh, animal spirits and so on. Fiscal stimulus is most powerful when you have a crisis, um, when the banking system isn't working, when the private sector is delevering. So I don't think fiscal stimulus is going to make a huge difference because what's happened is as, as a result of it, bond deals have gone up in the US, and that's going to crowd, it's called crowding out. So you get spending from one, one aspect of the economy, another aspect um, doesn't spend, and it sort of nets out. So I, I just don't, I think fiscal stimulus has been completely overrated. Mm. Uh, it's, just, it's just the biggest non-story for me. So don't sort of hang your hat on that. Conversely, I think some of this um, sort of sabre rattling that uh, Trump is doing, um, the, the silver lining of that is it's actually pulling Europe together. Um, right. So the thing that's actually pulled Europe together in a funny sort of way is you've had Brexit and you've had Trump being elected and suddenly Europe's saying, look, actually, they're kind of defining what we don't want to be and what we do want to be. Well, we'll move on to yeah. Europe a bit later, um, but that, that's an interesting thing which I'll, I'll challenge you on a bit later. Yeah. But so um, from you, is, is, you know, are Trump's policies, are they hurting the world? Oh, can, we, can we give him some credit for something mm -hmm. at some stage or is that not politically... <laughs> tenable for anyone. I mean, th I think what's clear is that um, since his victory, we've seen very high confidence in the US across the board. So whether you're looking at, um, you know, consumers, small businesses, house builders, manufacturers, generally sentiment has been strong and has stayed strong. Um, so, uh, you know, whether or not you get the you know, fiscal multiplier that you would get uh, under a sort of slower growth scenario. Actually, strong sentiment is underpinning growth, um, growth uh, over 3% per annum likely for the rest of this year. So, you know, in that very sort of narrow perspective, then um, the policy um, has been positive because sentiment is, is, is strong and that's driving the economy forward. And we are seeing um, finally a, a sort of build up in, in wages. The big 
um, concern. Obviously, if we sort of step back and look at how that, this affects the rest of the world, uh, particularly for emerging markets, is the extent to which the Fed needs to slam on the brakes. Um, at the moment, um, you know, that's not the case, but we've got a more hawkish Fed now signaling um, a quarter a quarter rate hikes. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that, that markets don't seem to be, you know, budging at all despite all the buffeting around from geopolitics, but we have seen um, emerging market stocks down about 15% um, since their high um, from, from January. Of course, the Shanghai stock market is down substantially more than that. So um, if you look at emerging market um, readings, uh, EMBI spreads, for example, those are back now where they were where they immediately were. after the Trump you, victory. what's caused that, by the way, quickly? Um, I mean, I think it, it is the, 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 the trade disputes it's and trade. also underlying worries about how far and how fast the Fed is going to move. How far and fast? Eric, um, what do you think is, is our Trump policy de potentially derailing? Uh, so, so I think there is, a, there is one very significant upside to Trump, which is that a lot of issues that were not being addressed are now people are thinking about them in, in a different way. I'm thinking more of sort of social and political issues and, 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 you know, and very real issues for a lot of people. So I think that is it's a good thing. And, and we don't know what the alternative to Trump would have been. You well, know, uh, my, my next uh, question uh, was, uh, would we be better off under Hillary? Would yeah. the world be better off? No, no. So, 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 so I think that, oh. yeah, <laughs> maybe you can <laughs> ask <laughs> right. it. But, but, but I, what I, and I'm much more confident that the U.S. will survive the impact of Trump than, than certainly the international system, which is much more fragile and, and does not have the same kind of deep, uh, in, they're not as deeply ingrained. And in countries that have gone through very recent uh, positive developments, like the countries that I used to work with a lot and still do um, in, in emerging Europe, you know, these countries, the institutions there are much more fragile than, than, in, in, the, than in, in the US. So, so, I, so there is an upside. We have a different debates and, and important issues are coming to there, which is true also about Brexit here, I think. But, but you know, the, the, the damage is also very real. I mean, b before we move on, I, I, we can't move on without talking about North Korea and what the panel thinks. And I know it's very easy, you know, one half the argument is that, you know, this is the first US president who's, who's, who's sat around a table, he's got, it's, it happened, it worked, no one said it would, so surely we give him credit. Others will say, oh, well, it's an awful deal, he's, he's, he's given away the farm. What, what does our panel think about this uh, in terms of future geopolitical stability? Um, does anyone want to put their arm think, in the air? I think that you know that the, the problem is we we just don't know, and that we're treating uh, the negotiations as if uh, they they're taking place under the normal rules, under normal circumstances. But you have two individuals who yeah. who may well you know change their minds um, in a, in a very short space of time. So I think it's 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 I mean it's true to say that it's, it's uh, impossible to predict, but I think even more so under these, uh, the, the current interlocutors. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I say, yeah. say some, I'm part of some of these, these um, processes. So I can say that, that um, the damage done in the G7 and increasingly in the G20 is very significant, but, and, and you know, it's, it's a very broad range of issues, and we just heard today that the uh, US is leaving the, the Human Rights uh, Council, but you know, which is probably uh, you know not the worst uh, worst of the, the damage, but you know there, there are so many areas, you know, migration, uh, climate. Yes, we, you could know, the, we, we could be here all day. We could be here all day, exactly. So, so, so yeah, no, absolutely. But but <laughs> no, and, and, and but you know, I don't want to. But but when you look at specific issues, I think there are ways for the to move forward. So look at what happened to the World Bank recapitalization, for example, which is a very significant thing which, which actually the, the administration uh, came, came forward with. So when you are, the, the, there's an ability to separate individual concrete measures yeah. from this sort of overall rhetoric. Okay, and just to round up on this, is everyone's biggest fear in terms of yes, the trade war? Is that everyone's biggest fear, the, uh, this trade war for its impact on markets? To me, no. To me, it's, me, it's, I thought the point that Sarah... Sorry, go on, you first. No, I, I think that normally the, the big danger comes from where you're not looking. So, you know, oh, and, the black swans, yes, we had a panel so on. So I think that the, the, the biggest danger for markets would be, from, in my perspective, is if um, the, 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 the Fed becomes sort of over-hawkish. Um, because I think that, the, that we've got um, 
I think we calculated there's something like sort of 300 trillion of global risk assets. 300, 300 trillion compared to an, a global economy of something like 80, 80 trillion. So, you know, risk assets are sort of multiples of the global economy. And high valuations are being underpinned by um, very low interest rates at a global level. So there's a, there's a tipping point at which people say, hang on a minute, I don't want to own equities. I'm going to buy a, a, a treasury giving me a juicy 3.5% yield. And we're sort of close to that tipping point. So that would be, so that, that's, but that could come because, you know, as, as we said earlier, it could be because, you know, the Fed says, well, look, hang on a minute, we're going to get this aggressive stimulus coming through, which is inappropriate, and we have to lean against it. So indirectly, it is to do with, 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 with politics. But that's, that's to, the biggest risk to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, that policy risk, I was going to say, in, a, in many ways, the problem is, for the first time in history, we have this globally coordinated rowing back from quantitative easing, so this quantitative tightening. And fundamentally, we don't know how it's going to work. Okay. Don't know how it's going to play out in markets. Mm. Markets don't know how it's going to work out. Policymakers don't really know. And so there's a real element of trial and error here. And the, the notion that markets might take fright and run for the hills during that process is, is not at all inconceivable. It's, so, you know, against the backdrop of a low rate environment, a low return environment, which I think is what, what we've been saying earlier, the possibility that that low rate environment might be front end loaded yeah. seems to me a very high high possibility. That's not a dramatic prediction, it's just an inherent risk at, at the moment. And if you add into the mix, as Sarah was saying, some key players in markets at the moment, key politicians who are more unpredictable yeah. than they have been in the past, that's a bit of a toxic mix. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, let, let's move on from, from the US and Trump and, and go on to um, another big issue of the day. We had various polls of people's worries yesterday, and the top of the poll was, was European politics. Um, the future shape of Europe, cracking up or growing together, is how we put it in this. Um, I might, uh, let's, let's start with, with, with you, Peter, and work our way down. I mean, I, you, you, Europe has to have, you know, what is the future of Europe? Fiscal union, um, what, what danger is populism having ever closer union? Can that ever possibly work? Does that just drive people apart? What's the next step for Europe? Yeah, I think, I think they're important questions. I mean, we've just actually put out a, a piece called The Fate of the Euro, which tries to look at some of these questions, both in the short run, but also maybe over a 25, 30 year horizon. And I think our conclusion is that, over, I mean, I'm genu generally a European optimist in the sense that I think Europe will, will in the end work. And I think the risks to either individual countries peeling away from the Euro, or even the whole thing blowing up, which I think is possible but unlikely, is either the, the integration that's needed doesn't take place quickly enough. I think most people would accept that the current equilibrium is too fragile and it's still vulnerable to another. The next crisis that comes along will leave Europe vulnerable. But I think, and you touched on this, if you try and force that integration too quickly, that can also endanger the system because populism, the people of Europe, may not be ready for that. So I think... I think the path that they're going along is the right one, but it's a, it's a difficult balance between getting enough reform done but not going so fast that you blow the thing apart. I might move quickly to Sarah next, because you said mm -hmm. that quote I gave you in your paper was Europe needs reform. Has it reform is it reformable? Is, is Europe just an unreformable entity? I mean, I think Europe has made some big steps since uh, I wrote that. So that, so that was about three years ago. It and, was, yes, um, I mean, the region has, has done well, um, and we're seeing a recovery in investment. Productivity is still weak, but improving. Um, and I think in terms of the reform question, we are seeing some uh, positive signs, particularly from France, for example, moving ahead in the face of um, widespread strike action, um, the, the reform of FSNCF, for example. Um, but uh, I suppose that the key for me is that Europe has shown itself to be very resilient through the whole of the global financial crisis um, and has, has come through uh, still broadly in, in one piece. The example of Brexit, I think, mm -hmm. will encourage countries to um, f you know, resist pulling away um, further than they, than they are. Um, but we can see in every single country across the EU that there are parties there 
um, either you know, sort of opportunistically or ideologically opposed to the EU and to the uh, question of further integration. So there's a sort of big task in hand for, for European leaders over the coming years. So you wouldn't agree with the statement that, that, that um, Draghi's I'll do whatever it takes I'll do whatever it takes is essentially what has driven Europe. It's, it's, it's more than that. Well, whatever it takes has been very successful. And I think it it's really just speaks to Europe's ability incrementally to address issues as they arise. Um, and to this whole thing about kicking the can down the road actually has been very successful. Um, you buy time and in time um, things improve. That's been the story so far. Eric, you put your hand up, and then we'll go to Klaus, and then we'll go to Darl. <laughs> sorry, no, no, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry I, I broadly agree with Sarah's uh, view. Uh, I think pressures are building up again, uh, you know, quite significantly. Of course, what's happening in Italy is, is very serious, and, and the general pattern of, of sort of new anti-Euro, Euro, if you look at the European Parliament, you may not be so interested in that, but actually what happened... Not in too much detail. No, not in too much detail, but what's really interesting is that the, what's happened over the last 20 years has been sort of the from being national to center, uh, going now to left, right, and now the, more recently it's anti-EU and, mm. and EU, so you have a completely new dividing line that's going through Europe. Mm. But I think uh, the Europe, uh, the EU has an armory that we have only seen very small parts of, and, and, and it will be able to sustain itself through, through this. Um, okay, um, so next, Klaus, um, and then we'll go to Davil about, about Europe breaking up or, or um, staying together. I and it is a political debate. Yeah, uh, Europe will be fine, I think. Uh, Italy uh, will not leave. Before, Italy yeah. will not leave the Eurozone. No, but I think, you know, as economists, we kind of have to, to, to nail our cars to the mast because there's, it's, everyone can come out and say Italy's leaving the Eurozone tomorrow and then it doesn't happen and then we come out and say it again. I think, um, I'm going to let you elaborate on this, but I think that there is a sense of urgency now which is coming from outside that Europe actually has to get its act together. So this week there's the summit and, and I think we're going to see some signs. But I think... People, investors tend to, to often get too excited about what Europe can do and how fast Europe can grow and that, you, you know, the, the expectations get spilled up. But then, just take the Eurozone, for example. We, you, the Eurozone is not an optimal uh, currency union such as Mundell Fleming uh, pr predicted it or wrote about it. Probably never will be, but that doesn't mean it's going to disintegrate. It's a, Europe is the art of what's politically possible, not what's economically optimal, in my view. And that's, if you remember that, you'll see that I think Europe is a, um, is a, is a fact of life. That these countries are landlocked. They have so much intertwined now, politically and economically. They will have to come together in Brussels or elsewhere and sit and talk about the situation. This is the, the way of the world since um, a, a very dark time in my view. And I think that's not going to be jettisoned. And, and so in terms of the economy, well, listen, the Eurozone has a rapidly aging population across, the, uh, across its key economies and productivity growth is historically quite low. So that means trend growth is probably below, it's probably below 1.5%. Right now we're growing at two, so that's really good in the Eurozone context. But I just, I think that um, it's, it's, of course there's, there's going to be challenges, but actually I think now, again, you know, that I'm going to pass it on to you, yeah. that, about, about the urgency from abroad. I think that's, that's true. Yeah. But Dawa, you said earlier you were very optimistic about Europe coming together. But also, in the other breath, you're saying basically that Italian banks could be insolvent. How, how do we address this fundamental economic imbalance between North and South? And also this political imbalance between Eastern Europe, which is far more populist, although populism actually, you could argue, is everywhere, but, but particularly in Eastern Europe. How do you then reconcile that with the European project? Um, oh, that's a complicated question. <laughs> Very complicated. It's a com think, Europe yeah. is, is, is a um, complicated. So I think that you know certainly Italy is the um, the risk because it's a large economy and it's been the outlier. Because actually, I, if you look at France, if you look at look at Spain. They haven't done that badly at all. You know, if you actually look at performance over the, you know, over the last 20 years since the Euro has existed, Spain, France, United States, Canada, mm. no difference whatsoever, really. Um, Italy, though, is a laggard. But the interesting thing about Italy is the lag, you know, why has it been a laggard? It's, it's been a laggard only since 2008. I think the first 10 years of the Euro, Italy was doing OK, nothing spectacular. So it's only after 2008. And I think the actual reason um, it's not to do with sort of... Monetary policy, not i.e. if it had its own currency, could it have done better? Well, indirectly, because what happened was that it, Italy never fixed its banks. Yeah. 
And that was the problem, because after a financial crisis, as in 2008, there's, there's, two, there's, a, there's two golden thing, golden rules. First of all, that's when fiscal stimulus is really effective, and you've got to stimulate the economy. And the second rule is you've got to fix your banking system as quickly as possible, and that's what, exactly what happened in the UK, the US, Iceland, Ireland, Spain eventually, and Italy never did it. And it was held back by Brussels, because Brussels, stupidly, was just looking at public debt, because they say, well, Italy, you've got a lot of public debt. What you should really look at is total debt yeah. in the economy. And Italy hasn't got any private debt, so its actual indebtedness as an economy is not that high. But Brussels sort of slavishly you know, said, well, you know, we're only looking at public debt, you've got high public debt, you can't do anything. Um, so now, in a sort of perverse sort of way, a lot, you know, some, what the populists are actually saying, some of it makes absolute economic sense. In other words, these, these sort of fiscal rules imposed from Brussels are, you know, are, are actually inapplicable or inappropriate for Italy. So, so you don't agree with Lorenzo Cordogna, who's former treasurer, um, who worked in the treasury in Italy, and he's a speaker. He's, he was on this panel last year. Mm -hmm. He said in a recent article that um, Italy won't announce that it's going to leave the euro. It'll just leave the euro. Because obviously, if you announce and do referendums, it hurts your markets. So... Um, is there a realistic, we talked about this in Black Swan, is there a reali realistic possibility that suddenly one day we wake up and the headline in the Wall Street Journal, FT, or... or not, not, not if there's, if they, you don't have public support for such a cataclysmic event. And at the moment, 70% of Italians want to stay in the euro. So how can you leave the euro? If the major, maybe it's 65, I don't know what it is, but it's a clear majority want to stay in the euro. So you can't just leave the euro when the majority of the, of the people think, want to the, stay in the euro. The problem is as well, these things, it's impossible for these things to happen without warning. Um, you know, even the slightest hint and, and markets start to pick up. Black swans, they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, yeah. um, okay, all right. Well, well, the final thing on Europe I would say we've got here is which we did talk a bit about was this productivity problem, which is a problem in the UK as well. Um, today, John McDonald, the shadow chancellor, said he was going to set up productivity if he gets into power. Interesting anyway, but um, he's going to set a productivity target as well for the Bank of England. How do we get European productivity if, if I can, I think if I can start with the rosy um, explanation, and then I'll let my my colleagues, uh, you know, uh, you know, tear tear that down. Um, th there is a, an argument to suggest that one of the reasons why inflation has been so stubbornly low, as has been the case in the financial crisis, is because productivity growth is higher than we actually think it is. Uh, that we're not measuring it properly, and I think that. Uh, first, by the way, let me just re reply directly to uh, the idea of, of a central bank targeting productivity, in my view, is absolutely nonsense. Uh, I just don't think that's possible. Uh, um, <laughs> so, but th that gentleman's not here to defend himself, I just, but um, th I, I, don't think that make, I don't think that makes sense. But I think productivity um, is a, um, the, the, the much more interesting for me is that capital seems to be very productive right now in the global economy. And it seems to accrue a lot of benefits if you're a capital owner, but it's labor which either is not good enough to be paid for its productivity or is not productive enough. And I think that's the main problem because, um, it, but I, I honestly don't think that we are good enough as macroeconomists to measure productivity. I think that's, that's. It's, it's, it's all in the measurement. Um, okay, anyone else like to comment on that before we move on yeah, to the next sorry. Well, I mean, I was, Eric. So, so, so I think yeah. obviously there are measurement issues, but, but I think this is a, a reality, and it's something that dates back way before the, the crisis. So this is a very long-term trend, and it's common for the U.S., for Europe, for uh, <coughs> East emerging markets. So it's, we can't just dismiss it, uh, I think. Okay. And I just think that in, in Europe, there is something which people don't realize, that the number of people in the labor force is going up dramatically. It's, it's going up like that. So the productivity you're getting out of the working age population is actually going up very rapidly. But people don't measure, aren't looking at it in those, they're looking at productivity per hour work. But I'm saying that you can improve productivity in, in many ways. And the reason that um, labor participation is going up is because of female participation in Europe. It's going up like, it's, it's a vertical, you know, it's a very, very sharp uptrend. And I think that's a very, very good story. So for example, in Italy, at the start of the Euro, 42%, only 42% of working age women were in the labor force. Today, it is 56%. In Sweden, it's 85%. Yeah. So, okay, I don't think Italy can get up to Swedish levels of participation, but it can certainly get up to, say, 70% or so. And that is a big tailwind. No one really talks about that. 
is it? I think that. Sorry, yeah, I was going to say. I'm not going to say anything interesting. You say. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think that batting average effect, as people call it, sometimes is 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 there. But I think there's still an underlying puzzle about why yeah. productivity growth has slowed. The fundamental problem for economists is we didn't really understand why it grew for 150 years at two percent, pretty much on a straight line. And so, if you're any economist tells you with with any degree of conviction what they think is going to happen, probably don't believe them. This matters, though, for, for you as investors, because you know, a lot of the story about, and I've been saying this, that we're going into a low return environment, a lot of that is driven by an assumption that GDP growth globally is going to be lower than it has been in the past. And part of that is driven by an assumption about lower productivity growth, part, partly it's demography as well. And so, you know, so when we're talking about a lower long run neutral rate for interest rates, settling down at three rather than five, a lot of that's to do with lower growth. So you know, it's possible that that's too pessimistic and maybe productivity with, will pick up again back to its trend or even claw back some of the lost, the lost years. But you know, it's difficult. The intuition would tell you that with driverless cars and all of the AI that's out there, it ought to lead to productivity gains. But you know, it's the old paradox. It, it's not, not doing it in the data that we measure. OK, well, we'll move on. Um, we, 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 we're... Run, it's ridiculous how quickly the time goes. Let's go to China, um, political and economic fissures. Um, would, would, let's say, Sarah, China, um, is growth sustainable in China? What could possibly upset the apple cart? China has changed. It's becoming a consumer nation, is it not? And, and is, is there a, a feeling that China's going one way and the US is going the other in terms of rates and economies? And what do you think? What, yeah, what, I mean, it, it, of course, it's extremely important to talk about China. We've, we've spent a lot of time talking about the US. We've talk, spent a lot of time talking about Europe. You know, China um, is uh, the uh, second largest economy in the world, set to become the largest economy in the world um, in the next few years. And it's growing at um, six and a half, seven percent per annum. Um, in terms of whether that growth is sustainable, we certainly think that it's sustainable um, over the next few years. Uh, we've talked about demographics. You have demographic factors that are going to uh, gradually slow the pace of growth, but we're still talking about 5% in, um, in, in 10, 15, 20 years' time. Um, for the moment, growth is good. We had a very strong first quarter. Um, there are clearly uh, worries about the impact of trade disputes with the US and at the extreme, I mean, if we were to see a, a ban by the US of all tech goods uh, from, from China, then um, that would hit Chinese growth by one to two percent of, of GDP and then there would be knock-on effects as well. Um, but we think that there will be scope for negotiations over the coming months um, and there's more that the Chinese authorities can do as well in terms of stimulating through fiscal measures um, rather than monetary policy. Eric, you're nodding. No, so I agree, I agree uh, again with, with Sarah, but I, I, so I, I think there is a fallacy in the thinking of the, the Trump administration that it's sort of just because it has this huge uh, deficit with China uh, that you know, you, it can push further and, and finally you know, there's not enough uh, uh, U.S. imports to, to, to put, um, uh, or, uh, there's not enough uh, uh, because the U.S. has a deficit, there's not enough for them to, to uh, put tariffs on, but there's, there's a huge machinery armory that China has used in the past that goes way beyond tariffs and so on. So I think this can actually uh, get uh, very, very, very um, damaging for, 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 for the world and for China. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree with the, the proposition that Chinese growth is broadly sustainable, that it will gradually decline as all emerging market economies have done at similar stages of development. Um, so the fact that Chinese growth will be at 5% or 4% in 10 to 15 years time, we should be relaxed about. In a way, the question is whether that will happen gradually or whether there'll be a, some sort of sharp slowdown, either prompted by trade or more likely by the underlying vulnerabilities in China, which to me are twofold. One is I mean, you say China's becoming a consumption-led economy, but still it has a high share of investment as part of its overall uh, GDP growth. And inherently, an economy that's driven just by investment has, has the capacity to, to slow down more sharply because uh, investment's just more volatile. And, and that's related to the second risk, which is just the, the credit-based element to so much of the growth, which so far 
I think the authorities have navigated well, but you know, there's, a, there's a tendency to think that the economic laws of gravity don't apply in China because it's a centrally planned economy. But so, so for me, that, that's where the risk is. But at the moment, I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that China will carry on propelling forward. They'll propel forward. And what about their relationship with the US? What could go wrong? Somebody asked a question in the Black Swans panel about a potential war within 20 years mm. between the US and China. And people laugh. But I mean, is that. Oh, I mean, Did it ever end like that? Could a trade war end up in a, in a, in a, in a military? Well, of course. I mean, it, there's ample precedent for trade wars ending up in shooting wars, I think. I mean, it, the, 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 the thing is, I mean, again, I think that would be a very pessimistic take on it also because there is already now very strong economic interdependence between mm -hmm. China and the US and the rest of the world. And also China, I think, is, for better or worse, now integrating in the global economy. I mean, the biggest change that I see in the Chinese economy actually is sort of a very specific technical one, namely that we've been used to a Chinese economy which first ran a very, very big twin surplus, so they had a big, a big trade surplus and they also had a big inflow of, of capital from abroad uh, to build factories there. Now, that's changing and uh, if, if China, a uh, China that runs a current account deficit sustainably, um, this is to say a China that needs the foreign markets to finance itself. That's a um, massive, massive change in the global economy. Because it's basically the PBOC's control command economy that goes out the window. Right now we are used to a world in which you know, they can just you know, flick a switch and then the reserve requirements goes up and down, they can control liquidity. If you start borrowing money from abroad on a sustainable basis, then that stops. And that for me is probably the biggest potential change for, for, as for the Chinese economy, because I agree that you know, growth is here now, it's probably going to go here, that's inevitable, yeah. but it's that, it's, it's that glacial change on the external account, which I think is, is critical. Can I, can I say, because I think this is really the, the big question, what's going to happen to China and to the world as China opens <coughs> up, because this, you know, we, we have not seen anything similar, and with these very deep distortions in the Chinese economy, you know, the, the size of China. People forget that. Don't yeah. They? yeah. There's good divisions within that. I mean, there was always that great quote, if, if Chinese growth you know, falls below a certain percentage, you're going to have civil unrest, yeah. and, and then the pollution causes civil unrest, yeah. and, um, yeah. you know, so I mean, politically, it, how stable is it? Yeah, well, yes. I mean, so that, that's one aspect, but I think what I'm thinking more of is just the financial sector is, is fundamentally distorted. Yeah, you know, there, the, there are a lot of uh, distortions across uh, regionally in China and so on. So, so this could be, you know, become. Well, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have models for thinking about. Is, um, I know what the right question to ask is. I don't know what the answer is, mm -hmm. which is how much malinvestment is there yeah. in China? Because the post 2008, um, it took over as a sort of big borrower, a big sort of credit bubble yeah. in, in the yeah, world, so. and it sort of did what the rest of the world did, mm -hmm. you know, in 20 years, in about five years. Yeah. So speed. And and then the question is, when you have this massive surge in um, credit. Normally, you have some malinvestment associated with it, and then the chickens come home to roost, and that's what we have to ascertain. Mm. You know, where, where is the malinvestment? Is there malinvestment? Because if there is, then we have to worry. Yeah. But I don't know the answer to that question. No, that's, no, we don't. We don't know the answer. I'm, I'm so sad to say we're, we're, we're running out of time. Um, I, we haven't touched on Russia or Putin. And very quickly, <coughs> how worried is the panel um, about some kind of, you know, another Russia-related incident derailing a rosy economy? Um, is it, it ha, you know, where is this on the worry list for anybody? Actually, I, I just wanted to say I'm not so worried about Russia, but um, I think um, you know one area that we haven't spoken about is is the Middle East and the yeah. potential there for um, some sort of shock which interrupts oil supply, for example, from Saudi. We know already that Iranian supply will be, um, or, or production will be, uh, will be reducing this year. Um, so some sort of shock that, that results in a big spike higher in, in oil prices. You know, if we look back at the 2008 period, people forget that we saw a doubling of oil prices in the 12 months to June 2008. So um, that's, that's one risk. That's that a very real to... and present threat. Yeah. Does the panel mm -hmm. agree that that, that, that that is a very real and present uh, threat? Just, just a point on Russia, I think that I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually a little bit worried about Putin because Putin is forcing Europe to play a game that it's not comfortable with, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is to be tough and to beef up on security and military. And that's logical and smart for Europe to do that, probably, but it also creates tensions potentially with a Russia that, that probably, in some sense, would like that confrontation. So 
Um, I think in some sense it goes back to what you said, it's, a, it's Europe is coming together and it's, it's forcing itself to integrate along another dimension, but it's a dimension of integration in Europe which uh, his, history has shown can also you know, create, create some conflict. And there's actually also a direct economic impact to this because we have taken this peace dividend for years sure, yeah. you know, that Europe has not been paying its part of, of yeah. its own defense. Um, okay, we are at time. I'm going to ask a, a quick fire round uh, to finish this. Can we put the poll back up as well? I just want to see if you, you can vote again in the poll if you like, um, <laughs> how, we, how we may have changed people's opinions or anything like that. We're still on here comes the rain again. Um, final question, quick fire round. What is the top of your worry list, starting with Peter? Just to distill the essence of our conversation. I think it's the unpredictable impact of the of quantitative tightening and what that might do to markets okay I'd, I'd be very I I'd, I'd agree with that we are now in a situation where liquidity is slowing and the money that's come in is now coming being drawn back and I agree that for markets and the economy that we don't know I agree completely we don't know how that's going to play out okay. Okay. Well, it's sort of related to that. It's, it's just that it's, it's what you said at the start, which is that you know, markets have been shrugging off um, yeah. all these sort of potential catalysts. The reason being that they've been supported by very loose monetary policy. Yeah, um, a lot of debt in the system. Yeah, and, and so if that, that's where the sort of Achilles heel is. Not that it you know, necessarily you know, crystallises into, into something, but that's where, the, that's where the risk is. Okay. All right. And in, in the context of that, I think we have to think about what would central banks and governments do? What can they do in the event that there is another shock? And a shock would come potentially, as I mentioned, you know, from a spike higher in, in oil prices, from an escalation of trade wars, geopolitical um, you know, concerns um, out in the South China Sea, for example. Um, but there's not a lot of scope at the moment for central banks and for governments to really deal with that. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Eric, you're, you're, what do you lose sleep over? Well, I think it's a combination of, of this sort of unknown unknown, which, you know, which is uh, this uh, withdrawal of, of, of liquidity in the system and the current wrecking ball you know, running through all these uh, in, uh, structures that are meant to, to kind of diffuse this kind of tension that's building up in, in, in this process. I think those, that, that combination is... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, say, I got too long. That draggy. Right. Um, okay. Um, so that is the end of our panel. I would like to thank, first of all, I would like to thank all of our panelists. Please give them a, a round of applause for their, their valuable insight. Um,